evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to Gulf Coast State College for another citizen science seminar. I'm Professor Carrie Fioramonti. I'm an associate professor of biology here on campus. And I have been hosting the citizen science lecture series for just a couple of years now. But I have to tell you, this citizen science lecture series has been happening for a decade. That's right. Uh, Formerly uh, St. Andrew Bay Resource Management Association, now St. Andrew Bay Watch, partnered up with Gulf Coast State College a number of years ago to bring these citizen science lectures to you, to the public. Um, and we are really happy and proud of all of the wonderful productions that we've made. I also want to take just a moment to thank Commodore Productions for recording all of our many citizen science lecture series. Thanks so much. Um, and sometimes at very short notice on a move. So Thank you so much for being so flexible. Um, but I, without further ado, I do want to introduce tonight's guest. This is Mr. Kennard Watson. He is the director of Turtle Watch here in Bay County, Florida. And Kennard and I, we've known each other for a few years. I think this is a wonderful program, Kennard. I wish I had more time to volunteer for it, but it is such an important and serious commitment. Um, but again, I, I thank you so much for heading up this organization and coming out tonight for our Citizen Science Lecture to tell us about your efforts and hopefully uh, to get some folks involved in those efforts. Uh, so take it away, Kennard. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Carrie, and thank you all for coming out. So um, we're going to talk sea turtles tonight, and I um, I have to uh, to admit um, uh, these presentations are a little nerve wracking for me. It used to be the public speaking terror, uh, but uh, I've gotten over that. Now I just worry about boring everyone to death, uh, which. Um, I worry that I give you some info that uh, you may already know, not be interested in, and I might be leaving out some stuff that you are interested in. So I think I've, um, I hopefully have struck a good balance on this presentation to give you some basic facts and along with some new info that I think uh, you'll find interesting. But if I leave something out, we're gonna have some time at the end of the presentation and I'll stick around as long as needed to answer any questions you may have. So with that, uh, let me uh, jump right into it. And uh, we're gonna hit four points, four main topics in this presentation. First, I'm gonna go over some general facts about sea turtles. We have three species that nest on our beach. Uh, then I'm gonna just get right into how our turtles are doing. There's actually some good news on Panama City Beach along with some not so good news. And uh, how we protect them, our marking and monitoring program. And then finally, most importantly, how you can help and get involved. And by the way, uh, just about all the pictures of turtles in this presentation are taken locally, not this one. This is a PowerPoint turtle. Okay, so who are we exactly? Well, we have a very simple, straightforward mission. It's to protect sea turtle nests on Panama City Beach and ensure the hatchlings make it safely to the water. That's job one for us. Uh, we also educate the public, uh, doing things like I'm doing right now, and advocate for their protection. And then finally, we recruit from the local community. Uh, we recruit volunteers to help us protect and monitor nests, and it provides a fun and meaningful way uh, for you to help us out here at the local level. And this is our operation area. We're responsible for 17 and a half miles of Gulf Beach between Camp Helen State Park and uh, St. Andrews State Park. So all the sea turtles I'm gonna be talking about in this presentation nest on this beach. Okay, some general facts about sea turtles. First of all, they're air-breathing reptiles, so they've got to pop to the surface every now and then for a breath of air. So when they're swimming underwater, they're holding their breath, just like we would have to. They're cold-blooded, so they need warm water to survive. They first appeared in the fossil record over 100 million years ago. Uh, think about that. Uh, they swam with the dinosaurs, and they survived their demise. They're adapted to life at sea uh, with flippers, not clawed feet, and they have a streamlined body for low drag and, and good swimming performance. 
They're long-lived animals, over 50 years. Unfortunately, they have to be dead to, to age them. They, they're aged by skeletal cr chronology, counting bone rings, basically. And uh, in their very late maturity, the loggerheads can take over 30 years to mature. The hatchlings imprint on their nesting beach, meaning the females will be back as adults to nest in the general vicinity, while the males never return to the beach after they uh, hit the water. And finally, all sea turtle species are threatened or endangered, and I'll talk more about those threats in a minute. All right, so Panama City Beach is home to three species of sea turtles. The loggerhead, a threatened species, is the most common in our area. It's a big turtle, named for its large head. It gets upwards of 350 pounds, uh, 3.5 feet long. And the important thing to know about the loggerhead is that Florida supports the largest population of this turtle in the world. Only uh, Oman, near the mouth of the Persian Gulf, has a comparable population, and it's crashing. All right, so the future of this species is very much in our hands. And they have a, kind of an omnivorous diet, but they like crabs, whelks, other bottom invertebrates. The green, a threatened species, is another turtle that nests on our beach, although in far smaller numbers. It's named for the color of its body fat, not the shell. It's bigger than the loggerhead, upwards of 400 pounds of four-foot shell length. Uh, it is, in fact, the largest hard-shelled turtle. And it is a herbivore, so it eats mostly seagrass and uh, algae. Uh, so you might see greens in the seagrass beds behind Shell Island, for example. Uh, that's why they call it turtle grass. And then finally, uh, the leatherback, an endangered species. It is named for its rubbery skin it's the only sea turtle without a hard shell. And this is a huge animal, upwards of 1,000 pounds, six feet long. It's the largest turtle in the world, and it nests right here on Panama City Beach. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, they have a diet mostly of jellyfish, and they have an amazing diving ability. They can dive to 4,000 feet. Uh, very few air-breathing animals can do that. Sperm whales can do it but not very many. It's a pretty, uh, it's, this animal is superlative in just about every way. It's pretty amazing. And in terms of when sea turtles nest, um, mating and nesting occur in the spring and summer with hatching in the late summer and fall. So this slide gives the basic timeline of events. So we're about to get into the mating season for sea turtles when uh, they arrive in offshore waters in the April time frame, and mating occurs through May. And then the first nests uh, are typically laid in May. The season will begin May 1st and go through August. And then the nests that were first laid in early May will start hatching in July, and hatching season goes through October. So the season officially runs from May 1st to October 31st. In terms of where they nest, um, it's everywhere, everywhere on the Gulf Beach, all right? But we do know they concentrate in less developed areas. This is a map of our survey area uh, with uh, columns of symbols representing nests on a half a mile section of beach for a 32 year period starting in 1991 when our program began. So basically, the length of the bars indicates nesting activity, all right? And you can see they really like the east end of the survey area near St. Andrews Park. I don't need, do I have a pointer for this one? Okay, that's okay. Well, just on the right side, you guys know where St. Andrews Park is, right? So you see the big bar there. They really like the Thomas Drive area. And going on the other end, the west end, near Camp Helen State Park and Sunnyside Beach, they like that area, all right? Uh, and we think that's simply because these areas have less people on them, relatively speaking, and less development. And the beaches are darker, and I'll talk about why that's important. 
Uh, but it, this also shows that they will nest in the urban core of Panama City Beach, you know, where all the spring breakers are right now. That's nesting habitat. So there's no area that's off limits for them. And this is how we find most of our nest. All right, so we have a daily survey program. We will be out on the beach starting May 1st. We actually have a Gulf Coast College student who's gonna be on the team this year, one of Ms. Fiermonte's students, and we're excited about that. Uh, so this is uh, Secret Homes on the left, Nancy Eva on the right, two of our senior surveyors. And uh, we get out on the beach early in the morning looking for tracks made the previous night. Sea turtles are nocturnal, so they nest at night. We get out there early when the tracks are fresh, they haven't been walked on or rained on. And uh, this part of the program, we have paid surveyors and is supported by the Tourist Development Council. So we're, we're grateful for their support for this part of the program. And this is what the surveyors are looking for. Uh, this is a fresh loggerhead track. Uh, this is a non-nesting emergence, we call it a false crawl, uh, where the turtle came up, uh, went all the way into the dune and decided not to nest and she went back in the water. This is a nest. This is a pretty much a textbook loggerhead nest here. The turtle came out of the water on the right hand side. She crawled up the beach and then she will uh, dig a hole in the sand with her rear flippers and she'll basically keep digging until she can't reach any farther. So the, the egg chamber will be about one and a half and she'll lay about a hundred eggs and then she covers over the nest and throws sand around and that's what you see this disturbed area of sand on the right hand side and we believe she does that to camouflage the egg location. It makes it harder for predators to find the eggs. So once she does that, camouflaging, she goes back in the water, she doesn't come back to the nest. And this whole process takes about an hour to do, and it's done at night, all right? Um, the, the loggerheads will lay several nests in a summer, uh, sequenced about two weeks apart, uh, maybe as many as seven, on average three or four, and then she'll take a couple of years off going to uh, her winter foraging ground to recuperate. Um, so that's a loggerhead nest. And this is what uh, the eggs look like. The, uh, the egg of a loggerhead is about the size and shape of a ping pong ball. The hatchlings that emerge from those eggs will fit in the palm of your hand and uh, takes them about two months to hatch. And I've got a neat video here now. Let's see if this goes courtesy of Betsy Straley of Turtle Watch. And this is one of the best hatch, whoops, let's try, there we go. I think it's, oh really? Okay. There we go. This is a really nice video of a hatching. This is a very, oh, oh, let's see, how did that just No flashes, please. That'd be you, Mike. Michael's not Mike, that'd be you. Yeah, the, the sound is a little extraneous on this one, but um, the main thing is... Uh, oh my gosh, that Okay, I'll do a little sound. We need to get ready to move back. This is late afternoon hatching on Sunnyside Beach. Um, we were lucky because this mostly happens at night, okay? So this is what we call a boy, a, a mass emergence. This is the only group activity that sea turtles ever do. All right. So you're looking at a uh, hundred turtles finishing a group dig, where they get to the surface and they're going to start their journey to the water. Now, normally this process occurs at night, and how they reach the water at night is through a visual cue. Uh, these turtles are highly sensitive to light. So on a natural beach, they crawl away from the dark profile of the dune and vegetation toward the relatively brighter open ocean horizon. Uh, the reason they come out at night is because a daytime emergent like, like this uh, puts these turtles at risk of predation by birds, all right? 
hatch. So uh, evolution has taught them a nighttime hatch is much better. These animals will be continuously active for a day or two. After they emerge, when they hit the water, they swim continuously until they get offshore and become associated with uh, seagrass, floating seagrass, sargassum, which has been in the news recently. Uh, and that provides both cover, developmental habitat, and food for these little guys. And whether this animal is male or female, believe it or not, is determined by sand temperature during the middle third of incubation. But the warmer temperatures tend to produce more females. And so this little guy or gal is, um, is going to make it to the water, I promise. Um, so we w I wouldn't show you it otherwise. Um, but you can see what a struggle, even getting through footprints, is for the, these animals. Uh, everything is a barrier. Um, but we let them do their own thing and um, make sure that they have a 100% uh, chance of getting from the nest to the water. Then they're on their own. I guess we'll watch this till the happy ending. I, I, it, it does end happily. Okay, it's so and a sea turtle biologist told me this is one of the best hatching videos that he's ever seen. And, and this is thanks to Betsy Sterling. Here we go. The little guy is in the water. And, uh, and then, by the way, they switch over to a na uh, magnetic navigation system when they hit the water. So it's pretty amazing how they. And this. If this is a female, she'll be back to nest in 20 to 30 plus years. Still working on it. Okay, she, I think uh, we're just about there. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, so thanks to our volunteer, Betsy Straley, for that video. That was on Sunnyside Beach, by the way. Okay, so green turtles. We also have green sea turtles on our beach. Uh, this, uh, first, we found our first one in 2002. We've had 23 since then. And we generally know if a green comes up, even if we don't see the turtle on the beach because the track is very distinctive, all right? And in fact, the next, I've got another video to show you here. Uh, the, the next video, we've, we've started practicing with drone footage and one of our surveyors, Angela Barros, has gotten pretty good at drone operation. You're going to see this is a, a green turtle nest that was laid just by beside Pier Park last season. And the turtle pretty much made a beeline for the dune. And so you're going to see the marked nest area um, coming up here right now. The greens throw a lot of sand when they nest. And uh, you'll see the nest mound and a body pit. The eggs in this marked area would be in the lower right part of the disturbed sand area. And that pit is where the green, green was throwing sand with her front flippers, okay? And they can move a lot of sand because that's a 400 pound turtle. And like I said, we know this is a green partly by the shape, the geometry of the body pit, but mainly the track. And the drone is going to spin around here, and we're going to follow the exit track. And you can really see the distinctive features of green turtles. They have a tail drag that you see in the middle of the track there that loggerheads don't have. So that's one feature. The other is they have a symmetrical gait, unlike loggerheads that have a scissor gait. All right. And uh, once you see a few of these tracks, uh, a good surveyor can look at that and instantly know that's a green, not a loggerhead. And this turtle covered some territory uh, going from the water to, uh, to the dune. The greens do tend to nest in the dune, unlike loggerheads. So uh, they're smart in that way. The nests are rarely washed out. All right, well, thanks to Angela Barros, we've started doing, uh, using drones to videotape uh, unusual crawls, uh, like a species that's uncommon, like a green, or something out of the ordinary. It's good to have the aerial coverage. 
And this is what the hatchlings look like. I think they're among the most gorgeous of all the sea turtle turtles in uh, uh, among the, the different species. They have this beautiful white fringe around their flippers. They have a jet black shell, just gorgeous, and with a with a fringe around the the exterior. They're bigger than loggerhead hatchlings, and they're more energetic, which for us unfortunately means they get into trouble a lot faster. So we have to really keep track of them. And leatherbacks, yes, we have endangered leatherbacks on Panama City Beach. Uh, the first occurred in 2012. Uh, that's a picture of the turtle in the lower right. It's also exa an example of what not to do uh, when you're on a beach with a turtle. More about that in a minute. But um, I still remember getting this call from the volunteers, and they said, Kennard, we're, we're at MB Millard Pier, and we've got a huge turtle on the beach. Uh, it looks like a leatherback. She's beginning to nest, and there are, a lot of, there are a lot of people watching. I really thought they were smoking something because I never thought uh, an endangered, one of the most endangered animals on the planet would show up at the county pier during tourist season and nest amid a couple hundred people. So, But she did, and uh, she did nest. And th those are the eggs in the upper right. We moved the nest because she, she laid her eggs very close to the water. It was in danger of getting washed out. And so we moved it to a higher elevation nearby. So, and there's no mistaking when a leatherback comes on the beach, even if we don't see her, because the track is so wide. Um, I, I actually tried to get this couple to hold hands, but the track was too big. They couldn't reach uh, seven feet wide. Here's that, that we actually got night footage of this turtle infrared, so we weren't illuminating the turtle. But you can see what a struggle it is for an animal that big uh, to crawl on the beach. That, that's a six or 700 pound animal, all right? And look at those front flippers. I mean, they're, they're the size of airplane wings. It's just remarkable. Everything about them is just amazing. Um, they're very graceful and speedy swimmers, but on land they struggle. So, so now I wish I had some leatherback hatchling pictures to show you, but none of our leatherback nests have hatched. Uh, we don't exactly know why, but it appears that the eggs are not fertilized. Uh, we have examined the egg contents, and uh, for whatever reason, all the eggs appear to be infertile, no embryonic development. Uh, it's possible that there are so few leatherbacks in the Gulf of Mexico that there just aren't a lot of male-female encounters to fertilize eggs, so the, the, the females are laying infertile eggs. That's just a theory. But, uh, but in any case, we've started seeing leatherbacks on the beach, and maybe that's some early indication of the start of a population recovery, but we, we can certainly hope. Okay, so where do they go after they finish nesting? I mentioned the loggerhead turtle uh, will lay several nests in a season, and then she takes a couple of years off uh, to recuperate, and they go down to winter foraging grounds. And we're learning more about where turtles go in the Gulf of Mexico through satellite tracking programs like this one uh, being managed by Dr. Ray Carthy at University of Florida, and he's also with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, so how this works is uh, they put tags on turtles while they're nesting, like the one on the lower right there. Uh, the tag is placed on the top of the shell such that when the animal pops to the surface to get a breath of air, the tag will send a signal to the satellite giving the latitude and longitude of the animal. So in that way, uh, Dr. Carthy can sit at his computer terminal and track these animals in real time as they travel along in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's what you're seeing here. They tagged four loggerhead turtles while nesting at Cape Sandblast in Gulf County, just east of here. And uh, two of the turtles, at the end of the season, migrated down to southwest Florida off, uh, off the coast of Sarasota, Naples area, where they spent uh, the winters. And the other two went farther down to Mexico off the coast of the Yucatan. And, uh, and so these turtles will stay there for, like I said, at least a couple of years, recuperating and feeding. 
and then they will migrate back to their nesting area uh, to, uh, to lay eggs again in the Gulf County area, presumably. So, um, so what we've learned from this is that the adult loggerheads will tend to stay in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the hatchlings, by the way, do uh, appear to get pumped out through the straits there and into the North Atlantic. So they will spend part of their life cycle circulating in the North Atlantic before coming back in 20 to 30 years to nest. It's a pretty remarkable journey that these animals take. Okay, so how are they doing? So um, turtles have evolved um, on beautiful Gulf beaches like these, these nice white quartz sand beaches, free of people, no development. Uh, that's where a lot of the evolution occurred, and this is what they have to deal with now. <clears throat> Just in the last 50 or 60 years, uh, we have increasingly urbanized beaches on the northern Gulf Coast, and unfortunately, well, or fortunately, we don't have time to talk about all these threats. Uh, but I'm going to leave this slide up for a moment just so you can read through it and, uh, and gain an appreciation for just how daunting the challenges are for, uh, for sea turtles trying to nest on a beach like ours. Um, that item at the bottom, climate change, is something I need to talk more about. It's not in this brief, but I hope... I don't know if this has been a subject of a citizen science lecture, but I would certainly be interested to, uh, to hear more about it. Uh, that's the looming threat at the bottom. But right now, the big threat is at the top. Lights, probably beachfront lighting is one of the number major threats, if not the major threat, to sea turtles on our beach. And so I want to say just a word about that. Uh, we know from years and years of doing this that uh, light pollution disrupts uh, over half of all sea turtle hatchlings that emerge from nests on our beach. So they would end up in the dunes or sometimes on the road if we weren't intervening with our monitoring program. It's a really serious threat. The long-term solution is to use wildlife-friendly lighting we do have a lighting ordinance on the beach. It's a work in progress. Uh, but what we tell people is the mantra, the three, the three uh, kind of tips is to keep it low, keep it long, and keep it shielded. Uh, low means uh, mount the fixture as low as possible and use the lowest wattage necessary to achieve the purpose. Keep it long means use long wavelength. All right, the part of the spectrum that contains the yellows, oranges, reds, much better than the other part of the spectrum, which contains the blues. That's why uh, Turtle Watch volunteers use red flashlights. It emits a wavelength that's less disruptive to turtles. And then finally, keep it shielded. Uh, use fixtures that uh, meet or exceed full cutoff, shield the lamp so it can't be visible from the beach. And you see an example of that in the uh, schematic on the right, a parking lot light that uh, fulfills all three requirements. So this is um, a work in progress, like I said, and it's a really serious threat to hatchlings on our beach. We estimate in addition to the 50% disorientation, about an eight to 10% mortality of hatchlings that we just don't catch in time and they get taken by predators and uh, in some cases wind up in the road. Okay, so in terms of how the turtles are doing, how do we measure sea turtle productivity? Well, at the most basic level, we count nests, right? So uh, since our program began in 1991, we have counted 911 nests, uh, over 90% uh, laid by loggerhead turtles. We also know that those nests have produced almost 47,000 hatchlings. Again, mostly loggerheads. And, uh, and by the way, not all, the, not all of the eggs hatch, and that's by evolutionary design. Some of the eggs are infertile, some of the eggs uh, get taken by predators, other eggs get um, suffocated by surf. That's why turtles lay so many eggs. 
Uh, so on our beach, we, uh, we estimate about 60% of the eggs result in turtles that make it to the water. That's pretty typical of other sea turtle nesting beaches. So finally, the ultimate goal is to produce turtles that come back to nest. And here, this is a little bit of guesswork, uh, but we, uh, we know from a general rule of thumb, biologists think maybe only about one in a thousand turtles survived to maturity. So if that's true, we produced about 47 adults over the past 32 years, okay? So we've gone from 911 nests to 47,000 hatchlings to 47 adults. Some of them are still growing up, by the way, because as I mentioned, it can take upwards of 30 or more years uh, for these animals to mature. So the recovery of sea turtles is a long game. It doesn't happen in a year or two. It, it's not gonna happen in my career. It's, uh, I'm gonna pass off to a new director. They're gonna continue the struggle. And, uh, and again, it's a little humbling to think all that work in 47 adults, but, uh, but you know, that's, uh, that's kind of, uh, that's how the, the rules of the game are. So I guess the question is, is this all good? Uh, well, another way to look at this is uh, to look at annual nesting. And here the news does get better. Uh, this chart shows annual nesting since 1991 when our program started and we found uh, 19 nests, all loggerhead. And you can see a lot of ups and downs, but if you look at the right side of this chart, beginning in 2012, the numbers went up dramatically, okay? From maybe only 10 to 20 nests in the early 2000s to now we're running 40 to 50, all right? So a big jump. The other thing that's pretty encouraging is the increased species diversity. Uh, leatherbacks, I mentioned, first appeared in 2012 and we've been seeing them more frequently in recent years, along with green turtles. So, uh, so that's all good news. Uh, but again, the question is, uh, so this big bump up in loggerheads, uh, what does this mean for the recovery of the species? The loggerhead's a threatened species. So can we, can we say that the loggerhead, at least on our beach, is back to historical numbers? Uh, well, to answer that question, we would have to know what was happening to turtles a long time before 1991, you know, what, when our beaches were truly unimpacted by humans. We'd have to go back a long ways for that. But there is some data, anecdotal data, on that. And we, we know that uh, turtles used to be a lot more active on our beach. And we know that from anecdotal data such as this one, a 1926 news article on sea turtles encountered near Phillips Inlet. Uh, the article talks about turtling as a golf beach sport uh, that involves hunting turtles on the beach for consumption. Uh, all legal, there was no Endangered Species Act 100 years ago. So uh, the interesting takeaway for me from historical accounts like this is that uh, turtle encounters were just a lot more common back in the 1920s, and also people knew about it. This, uh, you read this article and you realize that it was no big deal to tell people, oh yeah, we've got a bunch of turtles coming up on the beach right now at Phillips Inlet. Everybody knew that. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. But the bottom line is, from historical accounts like this, and recent nesting data, there's, there is no sign of a strong recovery of loggerhead turtles on Panama City Beach. They're holding their own, but uh, in terms of being able to say, we're done, we're back to historical levels, uh, we're nowhere near that. Uh, and by the way, to make turtling uh, feasible, and modern day turtling would be like turtle walks, going out just to watch turtles. And I, I often get questions about why we don't do that on Panama City Beach, and it's because we just don't have enough turtles. Uh, to make this feasible, we would have to have, instead of 30 to 40 turtles a year, we'd have to have 300 to 400 nests per year, okay? So think about that. We're a factor of 10 below probably where they were 
in the early 1900s. So recovery, we're on the road, but we're a long way from there. Okay, let's talk about um, how we protect them. So <clears throat> Turtle Watch, as things do, it starts simple and then it gets complicated. Um, it started out as just a little uh, volunteer program and now we've had basically five programs in one. So the first two are the paid survey programs uh, I'm not going to talk about those uh, so much as the nesting season and hatching season because that's where we use most of the people and most of the volunteers are, are involved in, in this part of the program. Straining and salvage, by the way, is very important, but that's for uh, generally more experienced folks, and so I'm going to skip over that as well. Okay, so nesting season activities here, um, if you volunteer for this, um, you get to move eggs to a safe location if the nest is th threatened by flooding, by surf, stormwater drains, or construction. Uh, in our case, it would be like beach nourishment. Um, volunteers also mark the nest with stakes, orange tape, sign, uh, like the, the one you see there. It's got all the scary verbiage on the, uh, all the, all the rules and regulations. And then volunteers are on call to respond at night if we have a turtle on the beach. And that's when you might get to see a leatherback at the MB Miller Pier, if you're lucky. We probably use most of our volunteers for this part of the program, hatching season. We've got crews of volunteers out pretty much every night during the hatching season. Uh, checking nests for signs of uh, an emergence, and then rescuing turtles that are disoriented uh, by lights. <clears throat> so trying to catch them before they get up in the dune or on the roadway. And these turtles are put in a cooler, and then we take them to a dark beach, generally the west end of the beach, and release them. Uh, we want them to crawl on their own to the water. We don't just place them in the water because we don't want to screw up anything that may be occurring for imprinting on that short crawl from the nest to the water. Uh, as part of our hatching season activities, we do public nest excavations. Uh, these are done to uh, determine hatch success and release any turtles still in the nest. It's actually something we're required to do as part of our state permit. Uh, but uh, we've, we've invited, started inviting the public to these events, and they become pretty popular. Uh, they are, um, they're announced on Facebook uh, three days before we excavate. So you can follow us on Facebook if, if you want to join us. You can either join us in person or some of these events are live streamed. But, uh, but this is a great way to kind of see what we do out there on the beach. And we also try to get out in the community uh, to do events, uh, set up at schools, uh, various, uh, various events. Um, so, um, so this is another thing we're active in as well. Okay, and finally, let's see how we can help, how you can help. So I showed this picture earlier as an example of what not to do uh, when you're around a turtle on the beach. Uh, that's probably the most important thing that people need to know is not to shine lights or take flash photos because what it'll do, it'll cause the turtle to abandon her nesting attempt and it will confuse her and cause, now just imagine a 700 pound leatherback crawling toward Front Beach Road confused. Uh, that's a problem, okay? So, um, but this is what everybody wants to do. If you're a tourist from Tennessee and you've got a leatherback turtle in front of you, I, first thing you want to do is, hey, let's take a picture of that and send it to the relatives back in Knoxville. So, uh, so I understand why this happens, but, uh, but this is probably the, one of the biggest things we have to contend with is people taking flash photos. So remember to do that. Uh, don't crowd the turtle. Stay at least 20 feet away. And, uh, and then call the uh, beach police, the non-emergency number, and they will forward the report to us at Turtle Watch, and we'll send volunteers out to mark the nest and do crowd control. 
And then if you're going out for a day at the beach, uh, we always ask people to just to leave the beach clean, dark, and flat, okay? Uh, so remove your gear, fill holes at the end of the day uh, to keep the beach free for nesting turtles at night. Uh, and again, avoid flashlights on the beach if you can or use red lights sparingly. Uh, this picture on the lower right there, all of those lights you see on the beach, <clears throat> a lot of those are families out with their kids looking for ghost crabs. That's a very big activity for the tourists. And so, which is great, we just tell them, hey, put a little red filter on your flashlight. And uh, these things, you know, these LED lights on these phones are intense. And that's what you're seeing there. So we don't, we, we're not making a lot of progress on that, but it's a big education challenge. And, you know, obviously some common sense things here, just don't enter the posted nesting sites for turtles and shorebirds and keep your dogs off the beach, except at Pier Park where they're allowed. Okay. So if you want to learn more about turtles, this is a, a good place. A couple of books I would recommend uh, by Dr. Archie Carr, the father of sea turtle research. He was a professor at University of Florida for many years uh, and an award-winning writer. Um, these two books are both great. I think The Windward Road is probably my favorite, but uh, these are great introductions to the world of sea turtles from a true expert. And there's another book I would recommend from a local legend, um, my friend Larry Ogren, who was a student of Dr. Carr and a specialist in sea turtles based out of Panama City National Marine Fisheries Service for man many years. Uh, this is him with his daughter, Kim. Uh, Larry passed away a few years ago, but this book uh, talks about his career and establishing the sea turtle station at Tortuguero, Costa Rica which is uh, it, it's just a great story. Okay, so what can you do? Volunteer, right? So you can contact us through turtlewatch.org. We work very closely with Gulf World Marine Institute. So when we have an injured turtle on the beach, uh, they're the ones that, that pick up the turtle and take it for rehab. So we have a very close working relationship with them and they have their own volunteers. So if you wanna get some hands-on experience, with uh, rehabbing turtles, they're a great place to check. Uh, you can find them on Facebook. And then uh, definitely buy a turtle tag. Uh, the proceeds from these specialty tags helps program sea turtle programs throughout Florida. And, uh, and some of that money has come back here to Panama City Beach. And uh, we've gotten education grants that we have used thanks to the uh, turtle tag. So I think that's, oh. One more, another benefit of volunteering is uh, you can make some lifelong friends. Uh, I think anything you do where you can find something that's fun and meaningful is gonna just, it's gonna attract like-minded people. And the result of that are some friendships that will last a lifetime. And some of these folks are no longer in Turtle Watch, but the friendships remain. So uh, I've learned to appreciate that more and more as time goes on. And with that, I think we have some time for some questions, I hope, and I'll be happy to stick around and answer any. Questions? The loggerhead turtles, are there any in captivity, like at a zoo or anything? Hey, Gulf World. Uh, Gulf World is a great place to go to see uh, loggerheads that are either in rehab or sometimes they have they may have a non-releasable turtle, a turtle that has injuries that won't allow it to survive in the wild. So definitely go go and check out the sea turtles at Gulf World. Yeah, they have a they have the marine park where they probably have some on display, and then they have the Marine Institute, which is a slightly separate uh, group. That's right. And then they would do wonderful rehab work. So yeah. loggerhead was. The ones that you see, are they the ones you haven't seen here? They are the most common sea okay, turtle. The in one Florida. that's less common was the leatherback? The leatherback. Or yes. do we have any of those in captivity? No, that's a good question. Actually, leatherbacks don't do well in captivity. Uh, they tend to swim into the walls of the aquaria, and their very fragile skin gets abraded. Um, I'm actually not aware of any non releasable leatherbacks in a marine aquarium environment. 
Uh, that's a good question. But I know they are very difficult animals to uh, to deal with in a confined space. Yeah. Is there a place? Is there a place in the world where they are more common and people have seen them? Leatherbacks are crashing worldwide, and you know, in that, that threat list that I showed in that slide, that didn't even get into the offshore threats, the commercial fisheries, longline fishing, pollution. Leatherbacks uh, are subject to bycatch. You know, they get snagged in longline fisheries, especially. So, in the like Malaysia, the population has crashed in Malaysia. There used to be a big leatherback population there. I'd say. Uh, close to home here, you would need to go to southeast Florida. Uh, Palm Beach County area probably has the most leatherbacks in the summer. Uh, but uh, you have to get very lucky to see one on the beach. Thank you. Okay. When the turtle is hatched, how soft is the shell and how long does it take to harden up so they can become useful? For the hatchling, the shell is actually pretty hard by the time they've emerged onto the sand. Now, when they first pop out of the egg, you know, their, their shell is curved. So it's pretty soft then, and it takes a few days for the shell to straighten up, but that's the time period when they're gradually digging their way to the surface after hatching from the egg. So by the time they've come out onto the top of the sand, it's been several days since they popped out of the shell, and um, the, the eggshell, that is, and their carapace is pretty hard by then. So it's not much protection. Those animals are so small, they're food for just about any fish out there in the surf zone. So that's why these survival rates are so low. We're guessing one in a thousand of those hatchlings make it to adulthood. I guess a follow up question then would be if, if, the, if it takes days for this turtle to work its way up to the top of the sand. How long does it take before it starves to death? Oh, well, what they have is a, an absorbed yolk sac, okay? So they have enough energy, like I said, to do the digging up to the surface and then to get off the beach and then offshore. So that's a pretty big tank of gas, but it's a lot of energy from that absorbed yolk sac. But they do eventually have to become associated with some habitat that allows them to feed. And that's what those floating mats of sargassum that everybody's freaked out about down in South Florida are actually pretty important habitat for these animals, okay? And um, that's, it provides shelter and food for them. So, but generally they can get offshore a few days of swimming. They're swimming constantly, okay, a day or two. Wonderful questions. Does um, does moving the nest in impact which area of the beach they imprint on when they come back to to nest? We don't think so. Um, the imprinting, that, that's an interesting question. You know, biologists have learned more and more about this imprinting process. Uh, I used to, when I first started in Turtle Watch, I viewed imprinting as they would come back to like the same spot, you know, maybe within tens of feet. And it's nothing like that. It may be the same region they'll come back to. So the turtles that come off of our beach may end up nesting in Gulf Shores, Alabama, maybe Franklin County, uh, you know, uh, in the, on to the east of us. So it's over a fairly wide range, uh, but still it's in the region. They'll stay in the region. We don't think moving the nest hurts them, but it can do other damage, all right? We can damage the developing embryos, by moving the eggs, and we can move the eggs from a favorable environment to an unfavorable one, all right? So, so there are good reasons to leave the nest in place and not to second guess the turtle, and that's, wh that's why we try not to move unless we absolutely have to. Sure. Is there any uh, data on a shell island? Uh, surely they don't just quit moving because we have a cut in, a, in, the, in the bay. Oh yes, they're, they're definitely turtles uh, are active on Shell Island uh, nesting there. I don't have any numbers for, uh, are, are you asking about the, the, the channel itself, if that has any? I'm just asking who, who is monitoring Shell Island. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so that would be the Park Service and Tyndall. I think they have shared responsibilities since the island is jointly 
manage to some degree, but certainly the part of Shell Island that's close to the pass is managed by the park, St. Andrews Park, and the rangers uh, will be monitoring that section of beach. The area to the east that covers Tyndall Air Force Base, they have a, uh, their own team of monitors. In fact, the entire coastline of Florida has groups like mine you know, monitoring particular sections of beach. Uh, everywhere except for the Big Bend of Florida, like Steinhatchee, and that's because there are no beaches there. It's all marsh. Yeah. Yeah. What's your percentage of relocation for nests? Like how many are you having to relocate each season? Well, that has changed a lot over the years. It used to be like almost 50% we would move a loggerhead nests. Loggerheads do tend to nest closer to the water than greens do, for example. Uh, but you know, we were moving, we, we learned that we were moving too many nests. And, and for the reasons I, I just mentioned, uh, we were seeing lower hatching success uh, in some cases, and we were worried that we were maybe doing some other damage. So in consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Commission that manages our program, we decided to cut back on nest relocation. So now we might move one or two nests at most in a season. Like with 40 nests, 40, you know, 40 or more nests, it would be under 5% we would move. So we've, we've changed a lot over the years. And, uh, and also with beach nourishment, that would be the case where we would be forced to move the nest to, uh, to get them out of the construction area. But otherwise, we try to leave the nests in place. Were the leatherback nests, all like 14 of those nests, were they relocated or were they left in play? I think that one that I showed was the only one I remember that we moved. Um, so um, I might be wrong on that, but I'll tell you what, that is not easy finding leatherback eggs. They are, they throw an enormous amount of sand and uh, we, have, we have spent hours looking for leatherback eggs. So that's the other reason we try not to relocate them. But, uh, but yes, we, we, uh, we did move that one, yeah. Okay. Good, very good question. All right. Well, thank you. Tonight. Thank you for coming yeah. out. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And and I I wanted to kind of kind of spin off of this gentleman's question too. You mentioned that there are programs all around the state of Florida. Have you uh, perhaps been in contact with them or seen what their data might look like um, relative to yours? Like with regards to are they also seeing mm -hmm. um, increased numbers of nests? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that chart that I showed of um, the annual nesting and the uptick that we've seen in loggerhead nesting over the past 10 years, uh, that has been observed in other parts of Florida as well. So, and we don't exactly know why there was such an abrupt increase in nesting uh, in uh, 2012. I'd like to think it has maybe something to do with what we've been doing all these years, maybe some adults entering the population, you know, from the early 90s. Um, and uh, maybe there's lower mortality. We're doing a better job reducing mortality out in the Gulf. But yes, loggerheads are uh, doing better elsewhere in the state. However, you notice in that chart, it's not just going up. It's going up and then leveling out. So there's concern that the recovery is still very fragile, and we're still not quite sure what's going on with the population. So. I think I'm, I'm channeling the experts correctly when I say there's no evidence of a strong recovery, both locally and statewide. And that's a big deal because loggerheads, this is ground zero for that species globally. Uh, there's no other place more important than Florida. Oh, wow. Well, that's wonderful, wonderful. And thank, thank you for that. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Kennard this evening? And so to volunteer or to uh, at least stay abreast of happenings uh, with regards to Turtle Watch, that would be, you could obviously like them on Facebook, follow Turtle, them on and Facebook. TurtleWatch.org Turtle. is probably the best way to reach us. And I just say be patient. We, uh, we have a limited number of slots available due to our various permitting requirements, but, but I promise we'll get you involved at some point uh, if, you're, if you're willing to stick with us for a while. 
uh, but but absolutely uh, reach out to us if interested. Yes, yes, and uh, you've also uh, brought just a few materials with oh, you. yes, thank you. Yeah. I love the handout, right? Um, so we do have some brochures here, uh, Kenner does, and also, is, oh, this is DVD? Or we is have, something? believe it or not, refrigerator Oh, magnets. it's a magnet. Yes, yes. <laughs> Didn't touch it. You can't live without one of these. Right? I love it. So we're actually installing these in Gulf Front condos on the beach, and it tells people basically how they can help keeping flashlights off the beach, closing blinds at sunset. Interior lights are not covered by our lighting ordinance, so one of the weaknesses of the ordinance, so we ask people to voluntarily do that, and turn off balcony lights. So uh, so yeah, take one of these and slap it to your refrigerator, and, um, and you can be a little unique in that way. Yeah, that's wonderful, because I do recall, because occasionally I might listen in on some of the council meetings, that they occasionally do kind of revamp the ordinance and that they were, uh, they add things to the ordinances that might, might have to do with sea turtle, uh, lighting, beha <coughs> people, the human behavior, and then a variety of other things related to tourism <laughs> and behaviors. And, and, <laughs> and I can assure you, none of these regulations are revamped voluntarily, okay? So they, they come from advocacy. So. Uh, you know, think about that when you're voting uh, for your county commissioner. Ask them what their stances are on environmental issues, whether it's water quality in the bay or endangered species management. That's the next big challenge for us: is improving the lighting ordinance, and um, and we're going to be we're going to be trying to work on that because uh, light lights are the biggest problem for us. It's been a struggle out there for decades, and I know, you know, growing up on Panama City Beach, I remember the huge spotlights that would shine down on the beach, and I know that's definitely not what we want to see. Um, and perhaps, uh, again, with advocacy and people getting out and being vocal at meetings as well as with their vote, mm -hmm. we might see some of these things change. Yeah. Did you want to also add something? Yeah. Um, Tyndall is doing all new turtle lighting. Um, yes, I, I've heard the same thing. I, I hope it's true. Um, so I, I, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kenner. We appreciate you. Please. Thank you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I want to make sure that I also acknowledge our, our partner, uh, as I mentioned to you, Gulf Coast State College. Uh, we host these uh, mainly, give you all a venue to come out, learn some really cool science stuff, and then also bring people together, bring organizations together. And again, I just wanted to also acknowledge St. Andrew Baywatch. They are our partner in our citizen science seminars. And I just want to remind folks, they do have some pieces of literature here. If you'd like to get involved also in St. Andrew Baywatch, they do a variety of other marine related activities um would anyone does anybody want to say what they are water quality, water quality may i would you mind saying something volunteer opportunities for students with living shorelines um yeah so water yeah that's a, a lot of good monthly water quality sampling and processing and getting data about st andrew bay and also as like grasses to classes things like that yeah, so if anyone's interested in that, be sure to contact St. Andrew Baywatch. It's, I believe it's, what's the website? I want to, it is standandrewbaywatch.org. Yes, and they also have a Facebook page. So I would be remiss if I did not also mention our partners. Well, thanks so much, y'all, for coming out this evening. We do have one more scheduled uh, that by the end of the semester, April the 11th. We will have Dr. Jessica Graham with the St. Andrew and St. Joe Estuaries program. Same time, Gibson Lecture Hall so far, but if I change it, I will be sure to let you guys know about it. Y'all like this venue? Y'all like this venue, don't you? All right, so please stay tuned for that location. Thank you.